I'd love to see Trudeau doing that. And
recording in progress. All right. Well, here we go. We're live on live stream. Uh, really happy to see all of you here today. Actually, we're not seeing the people on live stream, but I am seeing those who join us on Zoom. And by the way, you guys who are watching on live stream are always welcome to come onto the Zoom because you can fellowship with people and ask questions, etc. cetera. Uh, give us our your prayer requests and pray for one another. It's very, uh, it's a blessing to have these people around. Let me tell you that right now. Well, um, to, today we're going to finish off chapter 9, actually verses 24 to 27. And I that decided to finish it off because I wanted to deal with an issue. And that issue is, what is the law of Christ? What is the law of Christ? Galatians 6 2 says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So, what is that law? Well, Jesus assured us, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came from Jesus Christ, as John 1 17. By the way, you can look up all these references. I have this article on my site. So, if you want the references and you want to be able to look them up, go to the site and, and use the article. Um, Paul told the disciples, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God, not because of works, lest any man should boast, Ephesians 2.8. The grace of God appeared teaching us, as Titus 2.11. The gospel is a message of grace to be believed from salvation, Mark 16.15. We are saved by grace. However, under Moses' law, men had sought justification by law. And there was a great tendency for the disciples to seek righteousness through keeping of a supposed uh, system of law also. Well, the question is, could one be saved by works of the law? Paul gave a definite negative answer to that question. For no human being will be justified in his sight by works of the law, since so the law comes uh, through the law comes the knowledge of sin, Romans 2.20. By works of the law shall no one be justified, Galatians 2.16. I do not nullify the grace of God for if justification were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose, Galatians 2.21. And finally, Galatians 3.11, now it's evident that no man is justified before God by the law. The law had a weakness. It could bring death, but not life. It made nothing perfect. That's Hebrews 7, 18. It promised life, but proved to be death. Romans 7, 10. Because a person also uh, was required to keep all the law or be cursed. That's Galatians 3, 10. And none could keep it at all. At all. So all as the sentence of death. That same weakness prevents any law from saving. Law has no power to save. John assures us that all of us sin, 1 John 1, 8. James adds, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of it all, James 2, 10. So if we keep 99% of the law, would fail in the remaining 1%, what happens? We're back to zero. So it's all by grace. If one is to be saved, it must be totally by grace. One cannot be saved partly by law keeping and partly by grace. If grace saves, grace saves only to the extent that one is able to keep the law, then none can be saved. If one could keep all the law, you would not need grace. Our traditional exhortation to the one who fails to keep all the law is try harder. That's how we are. 
While giving lip service to grace, we frustrate disciples by urging that they must attain to attain it by keeping all the law or making a passing score anyway, whatever that may be. <laughs> the claim of justification by law keeping was another gospel of Galatians 1, 6 through 9. Any effort to be justified by legal means is a falling away from grace, Galatians 5, 4. Grace is not a quality of law. Our legal system did not replace another. The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus. Grace and truth were not a system of law to replace the old one. God didn't send another law. He sent his son in whom we may be justified. To save the persons, Paul explained for sin, for will sin, uh, so for will sin have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. That's Romans six fourteen. You'll want to read Romans three twenty through twenty eight and observe the justification apart from law is by grace as a free gift to those who believe. Righteousness is not attained by rule keeping; it's a free gift. Romans five seven. You can also read Galatians 3.23 through 4.7 to learn that now that faith has come, the custodian is no longer in charge and that God sent his son instead of another legal custodian. Ours is a personal relationship in him instead of a legal relationship. So what is the nature of our relationship to God? Well, the spirit makes us new creatures in Christ. But now we are just charged from the law, dead to that which held us captive, so that we we serve not under the old written code, but in the new life of the Spirit. That's Romans 7, 6. This new relationship is accomplished through the new birth. That's John 3, 3. By which we are all sons of God through faith. Galatians 3, 26. And in which our life becomes hidden with Christ in God. Colossians 3, 3. It's not a legal relationship, but a spiritual one. We enter into a covenant relationship. God made a covenant with Abraham and sealed it by circumcision. Genesis 17, 9. Later, the law was given to guide the covenant people. Deuteronomy 4, 4. The law was not the covenant of promise, nor did it make them covenant people. The new covenant is sealed in us by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1.13. This is done when we receive the Spirit at the time of our obedience to gospel. The other teachings are given to guide those in covenant relationship. The new covenant is not a written code. Paul wrote that God has qualified us to be ministers of a new covenant, not in a written code, but in the Spirit. For the written code kills, but the Spirit gives life. 2 Corinthians 3, 6. Hebrews 8, 7 through 8 further emphasizes that the new covenant would not be like the old one. His law is to be written on our hearts instead of stone or paper. How can the law be written on our hearts if we're not under the law? Well, to say that we're not under the law is not to say that we're not under the lordship of Christ and the sovereignty of God. Law has a range of meanings. Law may be a legal system that demands perfect obedience. Law also can be a principle of action. We're justified through the principle of grace through faith. Of course, that's Ephesians 2.8, Romans 3.27, Romans 8.1. And that grace activates something. It activates our love. What's the new covenant rule of action? It is love which God in his grace infuses into our hearts. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us, Romans 5.5. 5. We love because he first loved us, 1 John 4.19. God initiates the principle of loving action, writing his law upon our hearts. The love which he has created in us is the master key to unlock 
the, the servile chain of a, any other law. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not covet it. Covet, uh, covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this sentence. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Romans 8, 13, 8. Love fulfills God's requirements. It frees us. A legal code enslaves. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand fast, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Galatians 5, 1. Paul emphasizes these points again in Galatians 5, 13. Where you are called to freedom, brethren, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love be servants of one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. What greater and more comprehensive law or principle of action could we want? How would a listing of authoritative uh, demands help a person show love? God directs us into right relationship with him and man. And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, this is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and prophets. That's Matthew 22, 37, etc. All through the ages, God was trying to help us simply to love him and one another. It's that simple. That was the purpose of the law and the message of the prophets. God has shown us how to express that love through commands, exhortations, teachings, principles, and examples. Man has tried consistently to interpret these as lawful requirements, but God gave them as directives to love. Men argue, fight, and, div and divide over lawful interpretations, and therefore, by defeat the law to which God was directing. For Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is of any avail, but faith worketh through love. Galatians 5, 6. As covenant people, we are guided by these, but not justified by them. When we sin as disciples, we depend upon grace for our forgiveness rather than obeying more laws. And you can reference 1 John 1, 5 to 10, and 2, 1 through 6. So does this encourage sin, disobedience, and indifference? Anticipating such a question, Paul answered, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Romans 6, 1. He warns against abuse of our freedom, then cautions, but I say, walk by the Spirit and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. Galatians 5, 13 through 16. Freedom is not for unrestrained indulgence. So again, what is the law of Christ? Some would contend, some would contend that the entirety of the New Testament writing is the law of Christ. Then is the account of the birth and temptation of Jesus the law of Christ? What are the love chapter, the resurrection chapter, revelation? Are these all parts of the law of Christ? You know, the law of Christ is not a book, a listing, or a code of laws. Where is such a catalog of laws? We, we know that the Jews enumerated 613 laws in their legal code. How many laws has Christ given us? Since we are to keep the law of Christ, surely someone has counted and listed those laws so that we can have a checklist. But where is such a list? Christ's law is love. Yet he does give us commands, examples, exhortations, warnings, principles as guidelines for the expression of love, our response to grace. Christ's law is love. 
His laws are number one, love God. Number two, love man. Love is the new commandment, John 13, 34, which John's readers had heard from the beginning of their discipleship, 1 John 2, 7. And now I beg you, lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have heard from the beginning, that we love one another. And this love that we follow, and, th and this is love, that we follow his commandments. This is the commandment, if you, as you have heard from the beginning, that you follow love, 2 John 5. And this commandment we have heard from him, that he who loves God, should love his brother also, 1 John 4, 21. And it's a re-emphasis of the first and second commandments. Love is the royal kingly law, James 2, 8. Expressed love fulfills the law of Christ, Galatians 6, 2. Law is the law, love is the perfect law, the law of liberty, that's James 1, 28, uh, 125. Liberty from a lifeless legal code and efforts for legal justification. It is the golden rule, rule Matthew 7, 12. That ageless law that conveys intent and the message, the law of the law and prophets. How beautiful this is. God initiates the response of love. We love because he first loved us. He begins the working of his law in our hearts. He wants us to express it. His directives guide us in expressing it. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments, John 14, 15. So our expressions of love become God's expressions of love through us. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome, 1 John 5, 3. No burden. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and he who fears is not perfect in love. 1 John 4, 18. No fear. Keeping his law of love is neither fearful nor burdensome. We're justified by grace through faith and obeying the gospel. And efforts to be justified by law would nullify the grace of Christ. Our response to God's grace is the love that God initiates in us. The New Testament writings guide our love into proper expression. Now, therefore, why do you make trial of, by, of God by putting a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? That's Acts uh, uh, 15.10. So let's read uh, verses 24 to the end of the chapter. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not uh, run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. You know, we're like runners in a race. We need to understand that each person will be judged for his or her service to the Lord. The object of a race is to win the prize. We don't run against others by keeping in mind the goals God has set out for us. We run against time. Therefore, we must train to run. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Those who run the race will receive the crown, not an earthly one, but a heavenly one. Those who run to receive the praise of men and money, they're not going to receive the crown of righteousness. 2 Timothy 4, 7-8, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, 
I've kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. We also need to train so that we will not be tempted along the way and miss the prize because we've given in to the flesh. I think of so many pastors and church leaders who have fallen along the way to sexual immorality, drugs, alcohol, false teaching, etc. Paul's not saying that we should literally beat ourselves, but that we need to train ourselves hard so that we'll be prepared for the attacks of the enemy along the way. The enemy loves to attack church leaders because if he can get them to fall, he knows that others will have their faith shipwrecked. Paul believes that if you can run a good race, that, that you can run a good race and then fall. You can lead others to, to Christ and then fall yourself. This is the great danger today, which is why we need to train ourselves in the sermon. This is what's going on in so many places, in so many churches, in so many denominations, people who were formerly okay are falling, falling out of the race. Second Peter 1.10, Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never fall. First Peter 5.8, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking for someone to devour. 1 Thessalonians 5, 6. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. I often think to myself, these people who say they're woke, woke, they're asleep. They're actually asleep. We need to help them to wake up to the realities that the, the Lord Jesus Christ has shown us. That means preaching the gospel to them. Recording stopped. Well, I want to thank all of you guys uh, on live stream. And, of course, thank all of you here on Zoom for being here today. And, uh, you know, just uh, 